Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Speak Up. Today's special guest is a state representative who has found himself in years past in the same predicament that some people who have come before the Redress of Grievance Committee. When you get to that position where you go to the court systems to find justice and find yourself rather a victim, well, that's what this is all about. And I think you're going to find today's story very interesting. Well, thank you for joining us for another segment of uh, Speak Up New Hampshire. Uh, the show is called Speak Up because uh, we give an opportunity for people to be heard, for their voices to uh, ring out loud and clear. And I have a very special guest with me uh, today as a, a representative, Jeff Oligny. Oligny. Yes. Oligny. And from East Hampstead, New Hampshire. Yes, Jeff, yes. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Representative Evad. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to see you again. Well, it, yeah, we, uh, I just want to let you know that we do appreciate your service being a, a state representative for how long? Uh, this is my first term. First term, okay. Yes. And, and for being part of in, in the House and uh, doing what you have uh, been doing. And uh, right, uh, let's get right to it as far as what is the issue that, that brings you to speak up? Is it, uh, have you been involved with the family courts or, or some type of legal proceedings that the, you say, hey, well, what is this all about? What's going on? Yes, yes, I have. So uh, a little background on, on myself. Um, I have, uh, my, my motive is to help inform the public and help uh, refine and, and modify the way we treat families in divorces. We, uh, in New Hampshire, divorce about 5,000 families every year, and approximately 250 of those are contested divorces. Now, many of us think that the number is higher because the history is such that people have a tendency not to fight or not to have custody battles because they know how this, what the stats are. They know what the, what the, what the odds of them winning are. Unfortunately, the odds aren't very good for fathers. The uh, New Hampshire Bureau of Vital Statistics shows that out of all these divorces that I've just mentioned, every year approximately 70% of the custody awards go to mothers, 20% uh, are joint custody, and 10% go to fathers. And that's, the, that's all of the divorces. If you look at just the contested divorces, this same database shows that in, if, if the divorce is contested, the... Um, the win rate, if you will, is 80% custodial uh, awards to mothers, uh, only 10 to uh, joint parenting, and still 10 to fathers. So the statistics show a clear uh, bias that uh, fathers are not as engaged with their children as mothers are. I experienced that as a public member, mm -hmm. and when I did, my divorce was about 10 years ago, um, I didn't have a whole lot of experience with the system, I expected to walk in, um, you know, if this were the scales of justice, I expected the scales to be tipped a little bit against me, only because I was a man, right. and because I, I hear for, for most of my life that um, the men aren't, aren't really favored in court. Yeah. So I expected there would be some bias against me. What I, what I learned um, was really that there was a, a significant bias against me. The scales were tipped uh, all the way. Um, what I learned in, in, the, in a nutshell is that the system promotes conflict hmm. in families. And when you promote conflict, you create an opportunity for somebody to resolve the conflict. So this is actually a very big business. The more we promote conflict in families, the more we give opportunities for 
attorneys, guardians, psychologists, uh, therapists, mediators, uh, there's a, you know, judges, a now, host of people to make a living off of this. Now you serve on the Child and Family Law? Yes, you Children know? and Family Law Committee. Children and Family Law Committee. And you used a, a very interesting word, business. Uh, are federal funds tied to this business? Absolutely. There's an enormous amount of federal funds. This business, uh, we all need to understand, is a divorce is, is one component. The other component is domestic violence. They're both very much connected. So this is the divorce and domestic violence industry. The reason they're so connected is because there's a lot of federal funds that, you know, VAWA, for example, the Violence Against Women Act, there's a lot of money associated with VAWA that flows out to individual states. There's a lot of money that advocates um, receive to promote, uh, or, or, or to promote protection against victims of violence. Um, and clearly, we all want to do that. And it, clearly we all want to do that. I've right. never met anybody that was pro-violence. Correct. Um, however, this is a sword that can be, this, this is a shield that can be used as a sword. Now, in other words, you can, you know, there can be an allegation of violence. Many times in divorce there's an allegation of violence only because it's a litigious strategy. Right, and the, the veracity of the, the, the charge is not necessarily uh, well documented and therefore they cite doesn't, in the case of error. Doesn't matter. Right. Doesn't even matter. I mean, there's, there's cases, uh, many cases where uh, parents have lied and there's that, evidence. Does, does that happen? Oh, oh. <laughs> Family court has been referred to as liar's paradise. And, and, and uh, there's been cases where, where I've never heard that. evidence funny. has been brought to the court and they won't, uh, they won't act on it. They won't prosecute any for per anybody for perjury or false swearing. And the same evidence is brought to the county attorney. And often they won't act on it either unless referred to them by the court. So it's, a, it's kind of a vicious cycle where the citizens are having a difficult time getting a uh, an, an honest hearing uh, in, the, in the court system. Is, is this federal money, uh, does it have a, a title? Is it, is, it, is it called Title D money or? Title 4D. Title and 4D. I'm, and by, I'm by no means an expert on Title 4D, but it does have to do with welfare and it has to do with um, supporting the, the U.S. government, supporting states. Part of this Title 4D money is, um, goes to the courts, actually, through the Marital Master Program. Now, now, keep in mind, marital masters are not necessarily judges themselves. They are subcontractors. They are subcontractors. They hired are, by, the, by the courts. That's correct. To carry out certain orders? How does that work? They are de facto judges. Okay. They are subcontractors, as you said. They're hired by the court. They're attorneys with some amount of experience in presumably family law, and they hear cases. Now, is it true that they are on a timesheet? Is that, does that how it works? So if they get a, a, a case done quick, do they get, are they rewarded? Or if they get a case and they drag it out, is there an incentive to drag it out? Is there money tied to that? Well, they're getting paid by the hour. Uh, so their timesheet is, is the way that the state records their time spent on um, child support cases, and I believe a host of other cases as well. And as they <coughs> document their time, percentage of that time gets reimbursed uh, through Title IV-D. Interesting question to uh, ask you then. W this whole issue with the, the guardian ad litems, the, their, their whole function is to represent the child. That's from correct. What I understand. Now, if I understand the, the, the statute, each case is only allowed up to $1,000 per case. I believe you're correct. So if a guardian ad litem goes to a judge and says, Your Honor, or, or, or a marital master, and says, Your Honor, I need more time. Could you extend it? Uh, the answer okay. is yes. Okay. <laughs> well, how many times can they extend that? And, 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 and uh, it, it's, there's no limit. There's no lim limit to the amount of extensions or the, uh, the amount of money that could be spent on guardian ad litems. I, I've heard up to one case that they've had up to $45,000 worth of, of guardian ad litems fees. Some say, well, it, it's going to be $1,200, and then I'm $200 thereafter. I mean, we're hearing all kinds of stories. Is this coming before your committee? A absolutely. I mean, this is commonplace that the, my committee simply feels that when the court makes a decision, it's a, a rightful and just decision unless it's overturned on appeal. 
So if a, if a judge says to a guardian, it grants their motion to exceed their fees. Is it, is it guardian at litem? Uh, now, some of them are lawyers. Is this like a lawyer's paradise here? Uh, many guardians are lawyers. Not all of them. You don't have to be a lawyer. But certainly, there is a preponderance of lawyers in, in the guardian at litem field. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for all guardians. I, I, I know some of them. I'm, I'm sure some of them do a good job, and some of them don't. Clearly, some of them don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I happen to sit on the guardian at litem board who hears complaints uh, against guardian ad litems. And there's an interesting rule that um, the board has adopted, which states that the board will not hear a complaint against a guardian ad litem unless, uh, uh, in an ongoing case. Oh, interesting. Uh, unless there is uh, just cause, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't know the exact rule verbatim, but unless there's just cause to hear it. So in other words, what it means to me is, if you have an ongoing case, uh, we won't hear your guardian ad litem complaint until the case is over. Case, on average, takes probably two years to be finished and have a, a contested case. It take about two years to be finished and have a final decree. So at that point, if you still have uh, ambition and stamina, you might uh, bring a complaint against your guardian ad litem. Interesting. I, I, it come to my attention that uh, in, in many cases that have come before the Redress of Grievance Committee, which mm -hmm. uh, committee I serve on, uh, that some people are compelled to take a guardian ad litem, otherwise they will not see their child. Is, are you familiar with that at all? I think that there are a lot of strategies that litigants are um, exposed to. Clearly, the court um, doesn't have the time uh, or the budget to do in-depth investigations. Mm -hmm. If an in-depth investigation is what they are trying to do, which it is what they're trying to do, because our statute isn't cut and dry. Our statute doesn't say, when you were married, you had joint custody. Now that you're divorced, you will also have joint custody, unless, of course, you have been found guilty uh, of abuse or neglect. Mm -hmm. Our statute's not that simple. Our statute has a, a host of 10 criteria by which the court needs to evaluate the ability of a parent to create a foster and lo foster a loving environment with the you know other parent. Um, there's a, a there's a host of subjective criteria. The last criteria, by the way, is any any criteria the court de deems necessary or deems fit. It's pretty vague. <laughs> <laughs> so you can really com com replace all those right. you know, criteria with the court will do what it wants. Yeah. But the court is not going to make a simple decision. They're going to have a, a prolonged investigation. They don't have the time to do it. They subcontract that out. Mm -hmm. to a guardian ad litem. So the judge, ju judges are busy, so they subcontract with these marital masters, and these marital masters in, in basically subcontract to the, the guardian. guardian ad litems. Now, from what I understand, in some of the, the uh, contracts, because that's what they are, they're a private contractor uh, hired by the court, and you hire them as a representative for your child. And, inv and to investigate the case. To yes. investigate. And from what I understand, in some of these contracts, you waive your right to some of the information that they come across. Uh, that, that is true. There are, you know, for, for example, often psychological records are protected um, where, where one parent wouldn't be able to get any psychological records. And, and those records child. are put into a sealed envelope and presented to a, a, a judge. A judge can do an in-camera review of certain records that you know, he doesn't feel it's appropriate for the parties to hear. But routinely what will happen is this guardian will, the, the parties in a divorce will be presented with a, with a suggestion from the court to hire, to accept a guardian ad litem, to implement a guardian ad litem. Now you have to understand, here's a couple of people before a court trying to be cooperative. They're trying to show the court that they trust the court to administer justice, mm -hmm. and they want to take the court's recommendations and they want to be cooperative. So it's almost a conflict of interest when you're, the person deciding your fate and the fate of your children is suggesting to you to use a guardian. You kind of want to take the suggestion because you want to be cooperative. Correct. You certainly don't want to you know, uh, get on the wrong side of the judge. You don't want to be an uncooperative lit litigant. No, no, you certainly don't. So you are, in my opinion, unduly, unreasonably compelled to 
is, except this Guardian contract. Is, is this what happened in your case? Did, did, are you, do you have firsthand knowledge of this? I, I certainly do. In, in, in my case, uh, I didn't know anything about Guardian ad litems. My attorney said, uh, we're gonna, the, the court's suggesting we have a Guardian ad litem to, to, uh, to investigate you know, your spouse and you and your children and, and the interaction between everybody. And you know, we think it's a good idea. We think we should do that. Took the advice of my attorney, who is, you know, a member of the bar, along with uh, the judge making the suggestion. So, um, and how did that work for you? It didn't work out too well, <laughs> yes. uh, because oh, once you course. accept, because I, once, well, once you accept that uh, that that decision, you can't get rid of the guardian. Um, no amount of evidence can you bring before the guardian to have the guardian uh, removed from your case. The board won't hear your complaint while it's an ongoing case. The judge. I've never heard of a situation where the judge removed a guardian for, for uh, inappropriate behavior or, or, or bias or prejudice. Never have I heard of anything like that. So you can't get rid of this guardian at that point. Mm -hmm. So this guardian, and by the way, the guardian that took the job for $1,000 um, will very quickly overrun the 1000 And maybe weeks or months after that overrun would then retroactively motion the court to, uh, for a permission to exceed fees and those are just routinely stamped. We, so yeah, that carte blanche, just keep billing. We've uh, heard cases uh, where, where uh, the courts have actually uh, 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 prolonged a case, and like you said, said, by the way, we're going to go retroactive, and this is how much you owe. And by the way, if you don't pay it, you're in, you're in contempt. We'll put you in jail. And we're going to put you in jail. And, and you see the, both, you know, whether it's a male or female, they, they just stand there with their mouths to the gate, like, where did... What just happened? This really happened? Yeah. So, and, and, and that is, is, is probably what um, made me run for office. Uh, getting back to our first question is, 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 you know, why am I here and why am I a representative of my, of my community? Mm -hmm. Because I learned all of this um, through uh, a very painful bunch of experiences. And uh, when I learned what was really happening, I was aghast. And, and I said, you know, this, this isn't really the scales being moderately tipped, you know, uh, against the uh, the men, this was a this was a significant slant. Um, this is a situation where people aren't even listening to evidence, and the children are being hurt hurt in the, in this whole Absolutely. process. Now Absolutely. Now you just you, you you hit one of my little hot buttons, and, and that's this point of evidence. Recently, the House passed CACR twenty six, which is a constitutional amendment to take the rulemaking authority away from the judiciary and bring it back to the legislature where our founders originally wanted it. Right. And what we're seeing since 1978 is that the courts, when they make rules, some rules which conflict with already established rules. Or, such, st or statutes. Or statutes. Uh, do a great disservice uh, either to the, to the rules of evidence or to the rules of appeal, for instance, if you want to appeal for familiar status. And, and as it goes on, you, you see, well, wait a minute. If, if the courts can make their own rules, you, you basically killed your republic because a republic is based upon your constitution. That's right. Now, currently, that CACR 26 is before the Senate and needs to pass as is. It does. Uh, one of the things that I was, I was really heartened by is when you came before the legislature and you were offering... Uh, another bill, and could you talk a little bit about that one? I believe it was 591? 591, sure. Um, House Bill 591 was recently tabled. Uh, we, a number of months back, the bill, a little background on the bill is, is the, the bill was an effort to simplify the guidance that the state gives, the legislature gives the court on how they should make custody decisions. And I referred to earlier uh, to the list of subjective criteria by which the court is supposed to consider when they make a custodial decision. I basically eliminated all of that and I said, if the parents are fit, and by the way, this is supported by a lot of New Hampshire Supreme Court and United States Supreme Court uh, law, or not law, laws, but, but um, op um, not op uh, appeals, but uh, opinions. Um, Troxel, and Troxel v. Granville is one that I can think of off the top of my head, it's a United States Supreme Court opinion. It basically recognizes the rights of children to enjoy a relationship with both of their fit parents. So somebody asked me not long ago, a legislature, legislator asked me, well, what is fit? I work out. 
All right, I'm sorry. This is fit serious. is I'm you're sorry. you're fit unless you prove yourself otherwise. So you were born fit. Interesting. You, that, and that's what fit is. You are presumed fit unless you've proven yourself otherwise. Well, how do you prove yourself unfit? Well, in New Hampshire, there's basically two ways you can do that. One is by being abusive and being found abusive or being neglectful of your children. And I kept those two criteria in 591 because those are objective criteria. If I may just interject sure. with that. Now, those would require clear and convincing evidence that the, you are unfit. Is that correct? Well, where, do, where does that come into play with this? So originally 591 did ask for clear and convincing evidence. And through some negotiation with my committee, the Children and Family Law Committee, I tried to overcome some concerns. One of the concerns was clear and convincing evidence. Some of the committee members felt that that was too high a bar that needed to be attained, OK? So in an effort to try, and I didn't necessarily agree, but in an effort to try and get the legislation passed, I sacrificed and removed the clear and convincing part and, and, and left it as it is, which is just a finding of abuse or neglect. But if I interrupt, yes, certainly. 641A11 basically creates that standard of clear and convincing evidence, doesn't it? I'm not sure that it does. There's two other statutes, of the abuse statute and the neglect, neglect statute, that um, define uh, the, the, the standard by which somebody needs to be proven guilty of abuse or neglect. Okay. So, so those, I, I didn't touch those standards. I, I didn't want to touch those standards. Right. I assume that those standards have been vetted and properly established. Nobody's challenging them. All I'm, all I'm trying to do with 591 is remove all the subjective criteria, including any criteria the court deems necessary, to remove you from your children. Yeah, those, are, those are just like caveats, like the, this is just a get out of jail. That, that whole last one is, 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 is pretty funny. Um, I, I find something rather alarming, though, that when that becomes an issue, and yet one of the last things we voted on prior to the previous session was um, the, that the bill was brought up before the House where uh, if somebody would be accused of being a pedophile, just mm -hmm. accused, right. Uh, the bill would have uh, allowed them to be incarcerated, and almost you'd almost have to prove yourself innocent at that point, based upon this is hard to do, w right? Based upon a preponderance of evidence, pretty much. So if somebody whispered, "Hey, that one's a pedophile," well, that one's accused. Therefore, we are compelled to arrest this person, right. question you him, have to, and then uh, see if we can get a finding. All in the name of protecting the child. Now we have on the other side, fit parents, unless proven unfit, uh, that are not given the same. It, the House voted that down, by the way. Right. They said that, would, that that's just that's too much. You need a little bit more evidence. Maybe like clear and convincing evidence to prove that this person isn't an actual pedophile. Certainly, because, because that, that bill uh, would, would, would fly in the face of, of justice. I mean, Correct. you know, certainly nobody is supportive of pedophilia, okay? However, whether it's pedophilia or any crime. Or murder. Or murder. Right. right. You know, if you're accused, that's one thing. You need to be convicted in order to be incarcerated. And then we have on the other spectrum, fit parents, which are being accused of being unfit. Why are they not given the same rights? As because there's, those no, being, there's no rules. As those being accused of pedophilia. And this is what the public needs to know. Right. And it's not just the HOSP or this, this person or the Vandenbergs. Or, there's a number of people that are coming out with saying, hey, wait a minute. Why are my children being taken away from me if I'm a fit parent? Right. If I'm a fit father? Right. If I'm a fit grandmother? Right. If I'm, if I'm a fit mother? There, there is an issue. And, and you've tapped into this. You, you, you've seen this outright. And the remedy was 591. That's right. Where does it stand right now, Jeff? 591 is on the table. It's going to die a quiet death. Um, 591 came before the House about four months ago with a lot of support. Leadership asked that we table the bill and try to work it out with the committee, because this bill came to the full House with a 
um, with a recommendation from the committee that was, that was to kill it. The committee voted to kill this bill. Uh, I voted to, to pass the bill, but I was in the minority, and I did publish a minority report, but I believe there were three. I believe the vote was like 15 to 3 to kill this bill. So there would have been a floor fight where I would have been, you know, basically telling the House that my committee didn't really do the right thing. Which is really hard to do. Which is, which is really hard to do. So, right. you know, the, our leadership said, let's take another crack at this. Let's table the bill for today. We can bring it back. Let's see if we can talk to the committee chairman, re-engage the committee. Let's look at what exactly are the issues here and try to talk about this. By the way, this bill is directly in the Republican platform that many of us uh, ran under. Right. Uh, you know, it's almost verbatim in, in the Republican platform. So we tab I, I agreed to table the bill. Um, in hindsight, it was probably a mistake because what happened was there was no concerted effort to resume discussions or re-engage and determine why uh, the bill should be killed or supported. Nothing happened. So when an effort came then to pull the bill off the table, the committee chairman spoke against my suggestion to pull it off the table or my motion, and I spoke in favor, and uh, I didn't win. He won. So the bill sits on the table, and it will, it will die there. <clears throat> the only way to get it off the table is to get the House to vote for it with a two-thirds majority. That's correct. Which Overturn is, the ITL, which means to inexpedient to legislate. That's right. And then pass as ought to pass. And... And, and that's a feat in and of itself to get a <coughs> two-thirds majority at this late in the, in the session. Mm -hmm. But if we were successful, the Senate would have to accept it because we've passed crossover. Oh, interesting. So that, that just puts another tickle into that, the throat. That's just, so it, you know, as time goes on at this stage of the game, it's more and more unlikely that this bill will ever live. This is not the first time a bill similar to this has been presented. Um, the, the I, you know, where do we go next? I think the, the bill's coming back. It's going to come back next session, I'm sure, whether it's through me or some other representative in maybe a different form. Um, but clearly more discussion needs to occur. One of the, um, one of the lo logical, I would say illogical, but one of the logical arguments to, to kill this bill made by one of the representatives on the committee was that the United States Supreme Court freely recognizes the rights of children and parents. And the, US, and the New Hampshire Supreme Court does the same. Therefore, we don't need this bill. Okay. Of course, my response is, that is correct. The US Supreme Court and the New Hampshire Supreme Court do unchallenged. And nobody's challenging whether or not they support the rights of parents and children to be together. Uh, however, the, the New Hampshire Family Division routinely ignores those, uh, those findings of those other courts. And, and if you are to appeal to the New Hampshire Supreme Court, based upon the rules that the court made, they don't have to hear your case because of familiar status. Therefore, that voids what, no matter what the Supreme Court or the New Hampshire Supreme Court has deemed because nobody can challenge a particular ruling. And if you did get the opportunity, just say you did, we have the Jeff Frost case where this gentleman was, had to appeal on a totally different subject, nothing even totally related to the family courts. He had to spend $182,000. Yeah, yeah. The, all, the, all the fees are, you know, on average it's 60000 but uh, it goes up from there. Uh, my, my former wife and I, my, my family has spent uh, in our divorce about $130,000, $140,000. I have two children. My daughter just turned 16. My son's going to turn 15. You know, college fund. You know, no lawyer fund. Yeah, I know, but that could have been a college fund. <laughs> right, right. Wow. So, 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 Kevin, I guess when I say it's a business, um, there's a lot of people benefiting from this chaos that we uh, that we create. You know, if there's no problem, but somebody says there's a problem, well, now we get to go fix the problem. Right. And, and, and that's really what we're up against. So there's a lot of people's livelihood at stake here. Right. And so bringing it to light 
obviously is going to be a little bit painful for some people. That's right. But it, uh, it, it is causing some people, especially the children, it is causing them a lot of pain. Oh, so it, it, um, it sure is. It and, sure is. And, and of course, the, the parents who just have no idea. Their heads are swimming. That's right. Uh, so at least I think the first step is that the, the public hears people like you speak up. Right. And I'll, you know, <clears throat> that's what we're all about here. That, that's, this is a terrific opportunity. Right. Are there any final thoughts you want to leave with our guests uh, in regards to? I guess one thing that I'd, I'd like to mention, and you made me think of it earlier, there's an attorney um, by the name of Miller from New York State. And Attorney Miller came before our Children and Family Law Committee uh, I believe it was last year. And uh, this, this attorney, like many that have come before our committee, you know, we refer to them as beat up, chewed up, and spit out. Sides open, guts bleeding out. This attorney uh, has, had spent, at that point, $1.2 million fighting for access to his daughter in his divorce. His case... Uh, he lived in New Hampshire at one point. It was a New Hampshire case, although he's from New York. His case, his former wife um, uh, apparently made one allegation after another, sexual abuse allegation against, against him, against his daughter, um, one after the next, after the next. These allegations are free, and you won't be punished by making them. So why not? caused him an insurmountable amount of money, pain, time. Eventually, the New Hampshire Supreme Court sided with him and found that his former wife's acts amounted to child abuse. Interesting. They remanded the case back to the lower court, the family court, uh, to be, for reconsideration. I haven't followed the case since, but to my knowledge, he still hasn't seen his daughter. So despite all of that, the Supreme Court won't hear your case. They will just determine whether or not the lower court acted appropriately or not. So all the Supreme Court can do is remand the case back to the lower court where you'll get heard again before maybe the same judge, maybe a different judge. Um, it's, 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 that, it's that deep. When people are persistent enough because they love their children to go through this. We ought to create statues for these people exactly. in the center of town. But you know what we do instead? We refer to them as angry. Angry. Oh, that, angry. Blew, that blew my mind. Angry. You know, this makes the child, the, the, this whole, what you just described, makes the Salem witch hunts child's play. That, that's, yeah, that's, that's small stuff. It's small stuff, and, and, and people are accused, uh, confess you're a witch, no, I'm not a witch. Confess you're a witch. No, Stony. I'm not. You know, uh, well, you know, uh, you confess, you'll live. If time you go. Yeah, if you don't confess, then you're going to be dead. So confess. Oh, she see? She confessed she's a witch. Right. Kill her. Right. That's a good analogy. Um, and, and that is happening again and again and again. And, right. and we're bringing it to light. And I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thanks so much. All right. All right, my pleasure. Thank you for joining us for uh, another... Uh, Segment of uh, Speak Up New Hampshire, or Speak Up. I keep saying Speak Up New Hampshire, but uh, we are in New Hampshire. So, again, thanks, uh, Jeff Oligny. Yep. And uh, for you, stay tuned for our next episode. Thanks, Kevin. All right.